Larry Tai is a, an American nonfiction author. He's, he worked at the Boston Globe as a, a journalist um, from 86 till 2001. But the interesting thing to me is that in addition to covering sports and some national news, he also covered medicine and the environment, which are not the sort of things that, and we may ask him about that, that, that get you to, to Satchel Paige and, uh, and to, uh, to baseball. Uh, Satchel Paige, uh, he, he wrote it originally in 2009. It was a New York Times bestseller, uh, the biography of Satchel Paige, the life and times of an American legend. Um, and what he's, he's done is just bring Satchel Page to life, but he'll, he'll tell you more about that. A little bit about him. He was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University in the, the early mid-90s, won a series of major newspaper awards, including the Livingston Award for Young Journalist and the uh, Edward G. Neiman Award for Environmental Journalism. Um, and so it is interesting to me to hear him tackle a subject uh, and, and someone like Satchel Page who really didn't want to, uh, I think, be known. Uh, he, he wanted to remain anonymous. So please join me in welcoming Larry Tai. What I would love to do is actually start out by asking you, how many of you saw Satchel Paige throw a baseball? Anybody here? Where did you see him, ma'am? You did? Oh, great. Ah, in the 50s. How about back here, where did you see him? Cleveland. In Cleveland? In 48? Um, yeah. You're too young to have seen him in 48, but I'll buy that. That's the, you saw him in 48? And it was on TV. Sir, where did you see him? I saw him as a reliever in the 1953 All-Star Game in Cleveland. That's wonderful. The, he may have been, he probably was a guy who pitched to more teams in front of more fans than anybody in the history of baseball because he pitched for, if you believe him, and I believe him, for hundreds of teams over his career. And his career lasted so long that he pitched, I think, for half of America. What I would love to do, for those of you who never saw him pitch, I would love you to join me tonight in watching Satchel in three games that, to me, were really important games in his career and in the history of America and American baseball. And the first game I would like you to come with me back to is in 1926. And he was pitching in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is not too far from here. How far from here? 90, 90 miles. miles. OK, great. And he was pitching for a team inappropriately named the Chattanooga White Sox, an all-black team in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this was Satchel's first game in professional baseball. Does anybody here, nobody here has a baseball hat. Do you, anybody have a baseball hat tonight? Well, I want you to picture. If I had a hat, I would be tilting it a little bit to the right, because that's the way Satchel always did. And he walked out to the pitcher's mound with feet that were so large that in those days they had no regulation cleats that could fit him. So he took his street shoes, and they nailed spikes to the bottom of his street shoes. And that's how Satchel came out there. When he walked to the mound, anybody ever watched Satchel walk to a pitcher's mound? How did he walk? He moved very slowly because Satchel had a theory, and his theory was they can't start the game till I get there, so I'm going to milk the crowd for every last applause line that I can get. And he comes out to the mound. Sir, can you catch a baseball? We'll try. I hope for the people, the sake of the people behind you, that you can catch a baseball here. So he came out to the mound, and he threw his classic pitch, which was a Satchel Page fastball. Could I borrow that one back here for a second? That's the, yeah. That ball was pitched so hard and so fast that his catchers would actually cushion their gloves with a beefsteak so that their hands wouldn't feel like it was falling off after the game. Now, anybody who's an old-time baseball fan remembers the catcher's mitts in those days were pancake flat. And they really had to do that because that's how hard he threw. That was the good news. The bad news for the other team was he threw so wild that in that first game in Chattanooga, Tennessee, he hit literally every member of the opposing team. <laughs> and the last guy that he hit that night chased him around the field with a baseball bat. And the Chattanooga papers the next day said they weren't sure that he was going to live to get beyond his first game. <laughs> Anybody know where Satchel Paige learned how to pitch a baseball? And I'm going to give you a hint. It was the same place, the same kind of place, that Babe Ruth learned how to hit a baseball. 
Where did Babe Ruth learn to hit a baseball? What kind of institution? Reform school. Reform school. Now, I want you to come back with me not too far from here to Mobile, Alabama, and that's where Satchel Paige grew up. And at the age of 12, he ended up, for a variety of reasons that we could talk about, at a reform school whose very name says what life was like in much of the South here in those days. It was called the Alabama Reform School for Juvenile Negro Lawbreakers, and it was right outside of Montgomery, Alabama. The bad news about that reform school was that it was part of Jim Crow segregated Alabama. The good news about it was that it was actually started under the auspices of a guy that all of you know about, Booker T. Washington. What did Booker T. Washington stand for? What was his philosophy of black self-advancement back then? Anybody know? It was, say it again. Separate but equal, yeah, more, what did he, how did he believe that young African-American kids like Satchel Paige should get ahead? By your bootstraps. What he actually said was, you lift yourself up by your bootstraps, but you learn how to do one thing that you can do better than anybody else, and that's the road to advancement. Back then, there were two schools of black advancement. One was the Dubois School, E.B. Dubois, who said, we're going to overturn Jim Crow. Booker T. Washington was more of a realist, and he said, Jim Crow is going to be around for a long time, so you learn how to do one thing better than anybody else. And what Satchel Paige learned at this Alabama Reform School for Juvenile Negro Lawbreakers was how to throw a baseball faster and harder than anybody else. And he did that so well that by the time he got out, he said in a famous quote, he goes in at age 12, five and a half years later at age 18 he gets out, and his quote was, I traded five and a half years of freedom to learn how to pitch, and it was worth it. So he's in, we're in, back to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he's out there pitching on that mound. And first game, he hits everybody in the opposing team. After that, he had a coach who took him out every day before the game and after the game. And he took him behind the, behind the um, home plate. There was a fence there, and there was a hole, a knot in that fence, just about the size of a grapefruit. Now, anybody here ever been to a carnival where they tell you if you can throw a baseball through the hole, you win a big stuffed animal? And you notice that year after year, that same big stuffed animal is always there because nobody can throw it through there. Satchel Paige got to the point where he could throw five out of 10 baseballs through that knot in the fence the size of a grapefruit. So he comes into Chattanooga throwing hard and fast and wild, and he leaves throwing a baseball so accurately that he used to do something every game that he pitched in. He would perform this little stunt before the game for fans who came early. He'd set up a matchbook on home plate, a tiny little paper matchbook, and he'd walk 60 feet, 6 inches back to the pitcher's mound, and at speeds of 90 to 100 miles an hour, he'd throw 9 out of 10 baseballs directly over that matchbook. And that did two things. For the fans who were coming out and watching him in Negro League baseball and spending their hard-earned money, which they didn't have much of, to watch him, it gave them a little extra show. Before the game began, they could watch this guy performing. The other thing that it did, and this I think is a real reason he did that, should an opposing batter happened to be there watching him do this. Imagine what you were thinking of when you stood up to the plate and you watched a guy who could throw 9 out of 10 baseballs over a matchbook that size. You were having precisely the second thoughts that Satchel wanted every batter to have before they stood in against him. So we're there in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The year is 1926. He's 20 years old. The second game I want to take you to with me is 22 years later, and it's in Cleveland, Ohio, in the summer of 1948. Now, who was the lady who watched in Cleveland in 1948? What was happening in 1948 in the American League in, in uh, that summer in baseball? Well, not quite yet. You're in the middle of the summer, and you're not winning anything by that point. What happened in, there was a, the tightest pennant race in the history of baseball in the summer of 48 between the Cleveland Indians and who else? Boston, the wonderful sainted Boston Red Sox, yes. Yeah. Who else? An evil team from the Bronx. What were they called? The Yankees. So we got the Red Sox, the Indians, the Yankees, and one more team which no longer exists in Philadelphia. What was that called? The A's. The A's, the Philadelphia A's, the Connie Mack Philadelphia A's. Titus pennant race, history of the American League. 
Four teams competing. In the middle of that season, who owned the Cleveland Indians? Bill Veck. In the middle of the summer, in July of 1948, Bill Veck says, I've got a secret on how we're going to pull ahead of those three other teams. So in an enormous stadium in Cleveland, Ohio that fits 78,000 people, on July 6, 1948, there are only three people in that stadium. One of them is the owner, Bill Veck. The second is his player manager named Lou Boudreau. Lou Boudreau. What do we know about Lou Boudreau? How good a hitter was he? When that summer he was better than pretty good, he was competing with a sainted Boston Red Sox guy named Ted Williams for the batting crown. He was that good. Ted Williams, the last guy to hit 400. So Lou Boudreau, the player manager, is summoned down to the stadium early in the morning by his boss, Bill Veck, who owns the team. And he says, look in the dugout. There's our secret weapon for winning the pennant. Boudreau, who's been up late the night before, looks in the dugout and he makes out Satchel Page. And he sees this ancient Satchel Page sitting in the dugout. And he says, are you kidding me? Nice to see Satchel Page here, but this is your secret weapon, how we're going to pull ahead of the Yankees, the A's, and the Red Sox? And Vex says, don't believe me. I'm not going to tell you. I want to show you. I want you to stand in and take some pitches from Satchel. Can you pitch a baseball? No. You can't. <laughs> Can you pitch a baseball? Uh, no. Can you throw it to me? So Bill, Bill Vex says to Boudreau, stand in and I want you to take 30 pitches. Boudreau is in there swinging. This is a guy who's competing for the batting crown. Doesn't come close to getting a hit in 30 pitches that Satchel throws him, which is a good thing because the only one out there fielding the baseball is one-legged Bill Veck. <laughs> Didn't have to go very far. So Boudreau is so convinced that he says, I'm going home and going to sleep. I want you to do one thing. Sign him, Will. The next day, on Satchel Page's 42nd birthday, he is signed to his first major league contract. He spent 22 years from that first game in 1926 playing in the shadow world of the Negro Leagues. And finally, in the summer of 48, which is the summer, as we know, after Jackie Robinson was called up to the Brooklyn Dodgers, Satchel Page finally gets his shot. Any idea how he did that summer, how he pitched? Ma'am, I'm back to you. What do you think? He was terrific. That's all you really have to know that he was terrific. But I'm going to tell you a few stats. He pitched to a 6-1 and one record, second lowest earned run average in the American League that year. And at the end of the season, when all the sports writers get together and make their picks for the rookie of the year, 12 of them pick the ancient Satchel Page, the 42-year-old Satchel Page, as their choice for rookie of the year. To which Satchel, who never let anybody get the last word, says, I'm delighted at what the gentlemen have done but I'm not quite sure what year they're talking about. <laughs> so the only other thing I'm going to tell you about 1948 is he pitched the Cleveland Indians to a pennant. And the last time any fan of Cleveland knows, the last time the Cleveland Indians won the World Series was back in the Satchel Page team of 1948. So we started out in 26 in Chattanooga. We've moved to Cleveland, Tennessee in 1948. I want to take you to just say which. To Cleveland, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio in 1948. The last game we're going to go to, the last game is in 1965, and this is a very special game. It is in September of 1965, and a crazy guy, a guy every bit as much of a character as Bill Veck, owns a team in Kansas City called the A's. That guy was who? Charles O. Finley. Charles O. Finley, who was such a nut that he used to, he never wanted to go visit with the press after the game. So he would send a donkey that he called Charlie O into the press box after the game so that they could, that was what he thought of the press. So Charlie Finley has a team. The only thing you have to know about the Kansas City A's is that they're about as good as the Kansas City Royals are today, which means they never won a ball game. In September, Charlie Finley decides that he's going to try one thing at the end of the year to try to fill the stadium for a night. He's going to bring back the ancient Satchel Page for one night to pitch. So I want you to picture the scene. The bullpen is out there, and he sets Satchel Page up in an enormous rocking chair in front of the bullpen. <laughs> a nurse in a white uniform is there rubbing his arm. He's got this thing perfectly choreographed, and he succeeds in getting reporters from as far away as the LA Times to come in and watch Satchel Page coming back for one brilliant night. Remember, we're in 1965, and this is a guy who started out in 1926. 
Satchel Paige, as I said with Bill Veck, he never let anybody else write the last line for him. Satchel Paige, Finley didn't care what Satchel did when he took the mound. He had already filled up his stadium or come pretty close, and that was all that mattered to him. Satchel goes out there and he pitches, what does he pitch? Three innings. Three innings. One, hit. one hit. Who was the one hit? Yastrzemski, yes. Ma'am, can I borrow you for one second here? Could you stand up for one second? So after the game, Carl Yastrzemski goes up and gives Satchel an enormous <laughs> bear hug. Now, Carl Yastrzemski, thank you. That's all. We're done. <laughs> Carl Yastrzemski, who is not known, anybody who's a Boston fan knows, this is not exactly a warm and fuzzy guy. The reason Carl Yastrzemski gave Satchel Page a bear hug was because exactly a generation before that, Yaz's father, who was a potato farmer on Long Island, stood it up in the plate. He was in a semi-pro team on Long Island, and he batted against Satchel and struck out against Satchel. Satchel Page was the only guy in the history of baseball who struck out fathers and sons and grandsons. He lasted that long. That night, he was exactly 30 years older than his catcher. He goes down, after he pitches his three shutout innings, he goes down under the stands and is changing. And they come and get him and say, Satchel, put your clothes back on. They want you back out on the field. He comes back to a darkened stadium in Kansas City where everybody is doing what they do at a Bruce Springsteen concert. They're flicking their lighters and to this beautiful scene of all these lighters out there honoring him, the organist plays that old gray mare and they're serenading him. That night when he took the field in Kansas City, Satchel Paige set a record, and that record, you can't say this about many records in baseball, that's a record that will never, ever be broken. He was 59 years, two months, and eight days old. He was the oldest player in the history of baseball. He should have been the poster child, and he is today, for the AARP. I want you to think for one second what 59 years old means being out and pitching. Roger Clemens, several years ago, came back at age 45, aided by who knows what he was aided by. And he came back and pitched, and they called it a medical miracle at age 45. Satchel Page was 14 years older than he was that night. And he went out there after the game, when they had the post-game press conference, and all the reporters were saying, Satchel, this is wonderful. You came for your swan song, and isn't this great? And he said, swan song be damned. I want you to publish my phone number in your articles in tomorrow's paper and tell all those Major League Baseball owners that I'm sitting by my phone waiting for their phone call. <laughs> One other thing I want to tell you. So we've watched him in 26, we watched him in 48, we watched him in 65. If you remember anything I said tonight, it's not about any of those ball games. It is that Satchel Page, what I really want you to remember Satchel Page for, and what my book was devoted, uh, devoted to, was not Satchel Page, the baseball player, which everybody knew about at least in the legend form. I want you to remember Satchel Page, the racial pioneer, which is something that very few people ever think of him in that role. Satchel Page was out there for a generation before the world had ever heard of Jackie Robinson, and actually before Jackie Robinson was even born. Satchel Page was out there taking a barnstorming team, an all-black barnstorming team of all-stars across America, playing against pickup teams in any town that he could find anybody who wanted to play against him. And he said to those teams and those towns that he was about to come to, I will not bring my team to your town. And they wanted him desperately because he filled their stadiums. I will not bring your team, my team to your town unless you find them a place to sleep and a place to eat, which in those days, in those towns, was a huge thing. And enough teams and towns wanted him that they did that. And he said, by the way, I don't want it to be just any place to sleep. I want it to be a first class place to sleep. He was out there for a generation before the world knew about Jackie Robinson, bringing the attention of the white press and white America to the fact that there was this segregated world called the Negro Leagues. Every magazine and newspaper, from Collier's to the Saturday Evening Post to the New York Times, in the 1930s, when they profiled the Negro Leagues, they always did it around the signature player for the Negro Leagues. It was always built around Satchel Page. That's how journalists tell a story, is through a sensational character, and you didn't get more sensational than Satchel Page. The only reason Branch Rickey knew, Branch Rickey who signed Satchel to the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1945, the only reason he knew about an all-black team in Kansas City 
the great Kansas City Monarchs was because that was Satchel Paige's Kansas City Monarchs. And the only reason he ever discovered a guy who started that season in 1945 as a second string, second baseman on the Monarchs, a rookie named Jackie Robinson, was because he happened to be on Satchel Paige's team. So what I would love to leave you with is a line that is much more eloquent than anything I could have dreamed up that was told to me by an old Negro leaguer. And this guy said, it was Jackie Robinson who opened the door to the new racial reality in baseball. It was Jackie Robinson who opened the door, but it was Satchel Paige who inserted the key. Thank you very much. So the question was, did Paige have children? And the answer is he had seven of them. And he had them late in life. He had them around the time just before and just after he went to Cleveland, which meant a couple things. One is it meant that he spent, he sowed his oats for a long time before, and he lived an interesting and wild life. And at one point, he actually had two wives, one in Puerto Rico and one in Pittsburgh, and he lived an interesting life. But he had children. He was totally devoted to those children. He kept pitching in baseball long after he pitched that game, his last game in the majors in 65. He was pitching into, his, into the late 1960s and into his early 60s, including coming to Atlanta. There's a great Satchel Paige story in Atlanta where he came here the first year the Braves came to town when a guy named Bartholomew owned the Braves. And he came here as a pitching coach. And while he might not admit it, he struck out Hank Aaron when he came here and was just the... Um, but he had kids, and so I go about three months ago to Kansas City and the, was doing a talk at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. And three of Satchel Paige's daughters were due to join me. And the night before I had the most outspoken and feisty of them I had dinner with, and I thought, she wants to have dinner with me because she's going to give me hell. She's going to accuse me of calling her dad a bigamist, and she's going to say, why would you put in all these things? Why are they part of your story? She, in the first two minutes of dinner, she gave me this wonderful look that said, I know better than you all the things my dad did like that. And that's part of who he was. And then we proceeded to discuss what a brilliant character, and she told me some great stories. He had kids. They adored him. Um, they are around and active. The only one of his kids who had an issue was his son, who had the disadvantage, what turned out to be the disadvantage, of happening to look like Satchel. And everybody thought he's going to be a brilliant baseball player. Well, unbeknownst to his dad, he was out there shooting baskets around the neighborhood. And he loved basketball. One horrible day, he went out and pitched for his little league baseball team. And they kept him in as for inning after inning of them hitting balls further than anybody had ever hit them. And he went through that humiliation and gave up on baseball after that day. And the, his kids adored him. Questions? Well, I want to tell you just how long they lasted. And I didn't believe this when he used to say it. He said he pitched in 2,500 baseball games. Now, to give you a sense of what that means, the major league record holder is a guy named Jesse Orozco, and he pitched in about 1,200 games. So Satchel pitched, he said, in exactly twice that many games. And I thought, this is legend. It's interesting, but it's not fact. So then I started looking at it, and I said, geez, you know, Jesse Orozco, like most relievers, pitched every second or third game. Satchel Paige, because he was a draw everywhere he went, pitched every night for two or three innings. Jesse Orozco, like most major leaguers, pitched from April, if they were lucky, like the Red Sox are going to be this year, into October. <laughs> Satchel Paige pitched from April to April. He pitched in the Negro Leagues. He barnstormed. He went to California for the Winter Leagues. He went down to the Caribbean to pitch there. So he pitched year round. Jesse Orozco pitched an amazing 20 years. Satchel Paige pitched more than 40 years. So your question is particularly apt because I'm convinced that 2,500 might have been an understatement. And the way he did it, he had one serious injury in his career, which we now understand. I gave all of the medical records I could find to a bunch of smart doctors, and they diagnosed it as a partially torn rotator cuff, which we all know you rest for a while. So Satchel rested, and then he came up with brilliant stories on some uh, salve that the Indians had given him that cured his arm. Every, every reporter who asked, he gave him a different story. <laughs> I'm convinced he was just a medical miracle. And I'm also convinced that what Satchel said is you, you condition your arm by exercising it and by going out and pitching every day. He would say that these pitchers who today pitch every fifth game for a, with a pitch count and all of this stuff, 
that they're being babied. And what you do is you go out and pitch a baseball. And he and Nolan Ryan are on the same page with this. And he did it brilliantly and for a very long time. So the question was, what was the hardest part of the research? And I'm going to give you first a fatuous answer, which was the hardest part, the serious actually answer as well, the hardest part was writing a book worthy of Satchel, because he was sensational. He was a brilliant storyteller. And there's nothing you want to do worse as an author than taking on a subject that's brilliant and not doing it justice. And maybe I didn't do it justice, but, the, um, but that was intimidating throughout the process. The toughest part of the research was, unlike Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle and all the great white ball players, they had people out there every night watching every game and writing about it the next day in a dozen newspapers. So the records were there on what they did and how they did it. With Satchel Paige, through the first 22 years of his career, when he was playing in the Negro Leagues, there were a handful of black newspapers, the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the New York Amsterdam News. A couple of them had reporters at occasional ball games. The league couldn't afford statisticians, so no real records. So I had to go out and sort of scrub the earth for every small town newspaper that he barn barnstormed through, through every African American newspaper that covered him, through finding more than 200 old Negro leaguers and major leaguers who had been out there. And baseball players are brilliant storytellers. And what you learn is you never trust any story that anybody gives you who's a baseball player unless you hear it repeated three times. <laughs> so it was tough piecing all this together. It was made easier by the fact that Satchel wrote two memoirs, um, even though the two memoirs didn't agree on a lot of things. The, uh, <laughs> and it was really fun trying to piece together this puzzle of how the good news for me was there was so little record out there that while Babe Ruth had two dozen biographies written on him. Satchel had very little written on him beforehand. So it was going out and plowing new ground. There's also one last thing, and you didn't ask this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Satchel Page, one of the most fun things on writing a book is getting guys to tell you their story who aren't going to be around long to tell it. And so I came up with the idea of Satchel Page partly because some men I had written about earlier called Pullman Porters who worked on the railroads. These guys told me I had to write a book on Satchel Page. And whatever the Pullman Porters told me, I tried to do. But by the time I wrote my book on the Pullman Porters, a third of the Pullman Porters, by the time it was published, a third of them were dead, the ones that I had talked to. And today, just a few years later, more than two-thirds of them are gone. The great thing about doing the book on Satchel was I got to talk to people who were as old as 111. One guy that the New York Times wrote a front page story on named Silas Simmons, I went to his 111th birthday party, and he told me great stories. Two weeks later, he was gone. Buck O'Neill, I partly dedicated the book to Buck O'Neill, who sat down with me twice and told me his stories. And by the time the book came out, Buck O'Neill was gone. So it was a joy to be able to sit down with people and know that I was, whether I got it right or wrong, I was the last one that was going to get it at all. Anything else, and, sir, there? And we'll take a couple more here. Yes. So the question was, Baseball used to be a game. It's been America's game for a long time. And kids are being lost to baseball today. And how do we reverse that? And I want to note that that question was asked, the only questioner so far who's asked it in what I think of as a Georgia accent. So thank you for asking the question. And the, my, yeah, the, uh, my, that's how much I know from Boston. It all sounds the, uh, so the answer is, that's an, an incredibly challenging question. And it's a particularly, if I could add a twist to the question, it's a particular challenge in terms of African Americans. As you may or may not know, in the 1970s, a full 30% of Major League Baseball players were African American. Today, it's about 9%. And the question is, what happened? And the answer is, I don't know the answer to that. A lot of people a lot smarter than me have tried to figure it out. But I do know that there's a huge challenge in attracting African-American kids and any kids to baseball today. And the answer, I think, is what they're doing in Boston. And what they're doing in Boston is the team came into a situation, the new owners who took over and gave us two world championships um, in the last 10 years, they realize that they, every night since they've taken over as an owner, they sell out Fenway Park. So the challenge in marketing their team is not in selling out the ballpark, because they just they do it every night and they can charge the highest prices, which they do in baseball. Their challenge is in attracting young kids, in ensuring that they're going to get the next generation to continue to fill their ballpark. And they go out there and brilliantly market themselves with lots of programs through their foundation to kids all across New England to try to win these kids over from basketball, which did a brilliant job in marketing itself under 
Commissioner Stern and football and a lot of other things that also offer more scholarships. One of the reasons kids pick a sport when they're really good athletes in college is who's offering the most scholarships. And baseball used to have it the field to themselves, and now football and basketball have a lot more. They also realize that it's expensive to build a baseball diamond. It's a whole lot easier to put up a basketball hoop and do it that way than particularly in the middle of a city to find the land and put up a baseball diamond. So they're going out and underwriting those programs. The major leagues have started to do it through a program called MLB, where every team has what I think of generally as a token program, but it could become real to try to reinterest kids in baseball. It's a brilliant game, and it's a game that ought to be attracting kids today the same way it did in all of our era, and they've just got to start realizing the threat to them, and Bud Selig and the Boston Red Sox and some other people in baseball do. We'll come back and have this conversation in 20 years to see if it worked, but the a question back there. It was a totally nominal position. It was the owner, this guy Bartholomew, a lawyer from Chicago who owned the Braves when they came from Milwaukee to Atlanta. And he realized that Satchel was just, depending on whose version you believe, months, weeks, or days away from earning his five years to qualify for a major league pension. And so Bartholomew said, we've got to make it up to this guy. You know, He pitched all this brilliant baseball in the Negro Leagues. And the idea that Satchel Paige wouldn't qualify for a major league pension would be a crime. So he hired him. You, he called him at times. I read all these clips. And sometimes he was called the pitching coach. And sometimes he was called the trainer. And sometimes he was called any other name that you want to give him. Um, I interviewed the guy who, is, who was a trainer back then for the Braves and said, personally, I think was his name. And he said, Satchel never did any training. And Satchel never really did any pitching coaching. He was just hang, hung out with a team, told great stories, earned his pension and did one last thing, and I don't know if any of you saw, I wrote two days ago in the Journal Constitution, there was a wonderful space they gave me for an op-ed. And that op-ed was saying, and it wasn't me saying this, it was Bartholomew, the old owner, saying that in that summer of 1968, the summer of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, cities across America were going up in flames. And there were many reasons why Atlanta did, and you all know those reasons much better than me. But one of the small reasons why it didn't was because they had an ambassador to the African-American community by the name of Satchel Paige, who might then, if they had taken a vote across America, been the most popular man in black America. And he was out there saying calming things that Bartholomew said he became an ambassador in a way that nobody had ever envisioned and that was brilliant. And as part of my thesis on Satchel at different times playing a role of a racial pioneer, people thought partly because of the way he walked to the pitcher's mound in that slow style. And for a lot of reasons, Jackie Robinson and a lot of players that came later thought that Satchel Paige was a step and fetch it, if not an Uncle Tom. And the irony is that Satchel Paige, one of his closest friends, was a guy named Step and Fetch It. And <laughs> Step and Fetch It, who himself in many ways was a pioneer and not the character, not the Uncle Tom that people thought. But the same way people accused the Pullman Porters in later years of being Uncle Toms, they accused Satchel Paige, and that was just ignorance about history, because Satchel Paige made it possible. It was his shoulders that Jackie, his shoulders and Josh Gibson's shoulders and cool Papa Bells that the, jo that the Jackie Robinsons of a later generation stood on. Questions here, sir? Ah, um, great. So the question was, why did Satchel Paige end up in reform school? And if I had him here tonight, what one question would I ask him? And the reform school answer is an easy one, although with Satchel there were always two versions of the story. <laughs> so this is partly the question of where Satchel got his name. And the answer was, the version that Satchel told, which is a wonderful version, is that when he was a pint-sized kid, he, like all of his 11 brothers and sisters, had to do something to help put food on the table. And he worked at the local l and train station in Mobile, and he carried people's suitcases. Only rather than carting one at a time and only earning a dime tip, he strung up ropes and pulleys that he could carry three or four at a time. And his buddy looked at him and said, you look like a walking satchel tree or a walking suitcase tree, and the name Satchel stuck. And that's a great version, except that his buddy Wilbur Hines outlived him. And the version that he tells is that instead of carrying people's suitcases, he was filching the suitcases, <laughs> and that he, Wilbur Hines, dubbed him Satchel. The fact is that Satchel had a lot of things on his record as a 12-year-old. He skipped school a lot to fish or to work at the train station, and that got him in trouble with the truant officer. He stole things one day from a five-in-time, a bunch of trinkets, and he admitted that in later years. 
He did a number of things. He ended up in front of the court. The court said, we've had enough with you, and you're going off to this reform school. The good news was that reform school, as we talked about, was Booker T. Washington School. And half the kids in the reform school, their main crime was they grew up in families too poor to really keep a hold of them, and with too many other kids, in his case, 12 kids at home. So that's why he ended up in reform school. It was the best thing that ever happened to him. In later life, he said he would have been dead by the time he was 18 if he had stayed in Mobile, and instead he was a brilliant pitcher. So if Satchel Paige came here tonight, I would ask him two things. One would be, I'd say, I don't want to hear anything from you. I just want to watch you pitch a baseball. <laughs> and he'd be about 100 years old, but I'm convinced that he could still go out there and strike out everybody but Carl Yastrzemski. The other thing I would want to do is I would never limit it to one question. I want to say, I want to spend an evening with you, and we're going to go out in back of the library here, and we're going to fish for a catfish. I don't know if they have them there, because that was his favorite thing in the world, was not pitching a baseball. It was finding a great watering hole and fishing for catfish. And I would say, any stories that you want to tell me tonight, I would love to hear. And I just want to spend a whole night with him. Great. One last, uh, any last question here? Right here, and then we'll call it. Um, very good question, and he made a lot of money. He made, and I'd have to look at the book for the specifics, but it was like $40,000 a year in the late 30s and early 40s. And to put that into context, $40,000 a year was what Joe DiMaggio and Babe Ruth were earning. It was exactly twice what the average guy in the New York Yankees was earning then. And he was making more money than anybody in any sport. And that was the good news. The bad news was that he had to, as we discussed, pitch every night all year round and work harder than anybody in any sport. But he was making great money. When he went to, he may be the only guy who ever went from the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues and took a pay cut. Because <laughs> the Cleveland Indians weren't about to pay him this $40,000. But it was, he made a lot of money. For his kids, that was nice. But it was ancient history, because he never saved his money. And it was only later, when he had kids and he really had to worry about supporting them, that he worried about saving them. He had closets. He had his shoe closet. He had his tie closet. He had his several suit closets. He owned houses. He lost houses. He did, I mean, he was extraordinary. And he knew how to live well. And he never had kids to think about, I need this legacy. The great news was his third wife um, was, no, wait a minute, what am I saying? One, two, yeah, his third wife. His third wife was the wife who lasted for the rest of his life. She was a brilliant saver. She was a brilliant mother. She, tamed Satchel as much as anybody could ever tame him. And at the end, he could support his kids through school. They went to college. They did great things. And he was a great guy. And thank you. You've been a great audience.